today is a start of a two-day sequence looking at different specific revenue sources, taxes, and charges. And so, because this is the first session about taxes, we're going to do a few things before looking at the income tax. So, a few comments about appropriate tax systems, and then a few comments about if you introduce a new tax, or you change an existing tax, how do you evaluate if it's good or bad? And then we will apply these general principles about a good tax to the income tax. And then the next session, uh, Professor Suntan will look at the same principles as apply to consumption-based taxes, like value-added tax. So the first topic about appropriate tax systems. So you might recall yesterday um, the Assistant Director General for Internal Tax Division explained the difference between a tax and a fee. So to summarize, a tax is a mandatory contribution to the government not tied to a specific benefit. So these are general funds that go into the treasury and then they are divided through the budget process. So it doesn't directly add value to the economy. All you're doing is transferring resources from households and businesses to the government to spend on behalf of the people. And taxes today are usually paid in money but in the past, it could be paid in other forms. For example, one of the first taxes in the world was in China, and it was paid in salt. And today, some countries have a requirement that everybody, or mainly men, must serve in the military, like South Korea. This is true also in Singapore. This is also a tax, but it's your time rather than money. So how does this differ from a charge or a fee? So the fee is voluntary based on a specific service that you receive. So remember the tax, you must pay. But for the fee, if you don't want the service, you don't pay. And the more you use, the more you pay. So for example, a charge for water or electricity, the more you use, the more you pay. Or a toll road, if you don't want to pay the toll, you can take another road that might be slower. If you want to go faster, you take the toll road and you pay, and often by distance, the further you drive, the more you pay. So payment is based on usage. For taxes, payment is based on your ability to pay. The richer should pay more, the poor pay less. So it's a very different concept. So when I said appropriate taxes, we have an idea what a tax is, so what do I mean by an appropriate tax? There is not a single perfect model tax system for everybody in the world. And the appropriate tax for one country might change over time as the country develops and the economy changes. So in figuring out what makes sense for Myanmar today, we look at what we call your fiscal architecture or your tax design. So for Myanmar, I would ask some questions to figure out what makes sense now for you. So one question would be, what is the structure of the economy and what are your potential tax bases? And the structure of the economy here would look very different from the structure of a high income country. For example, is the country mostly rural? or mostly urban. If it's mostly rural, it will be less cash-based. If it's mostly urban, almost everything is in cash, monetized. Is the economy mostly formal or non-formal? And this is especially important for direct taxes like the income tax. So if it's mostly formal, then people get salaries and you can simply deduct the tax withhold it from their payment. So this would be something like in Myanmar civil servants and maybe for employees of large corporations or multinationals. But if your economy is mostly family businesses, small businesses, farmers, you, you 
if you do the income tax, they actually have to report the income to you voluntarily, and you have to calculate the tax. It's a very, very different problem. So most emerging economies are not formal, and so income tax or direct taxes tend to be a very small part of total revenue. It's just administratively too difficult to collect. But if you look at an economy like <clears throat> the United States, roughly 90%, 9-0, of all central government revenue is from some type of payroll deduction or withholding tax. For example, personal income tax, the national pension program, national health care for retired people program. All of these are deducted before you get your salary. For example, at Harvard, I see my gross income first, minus federal income tax, minus federal pension program, Social Security, minus national health care program, Medicare, minus unemployment insurance program, minus state income tax, and then finally what is left goes to me. So it's a different system if you look at a country um, that's lower income, most of the revenue will come from indirect taxes. For example, value-added tax, special taxes like excise taxes, trade taxes, because administratively it's more feasible to collect the indirect taxes than direct tax. It's not saying one system is better than the other, it's just being practical. So in addition to looking at the structure of your economy, you also want to look at the capacity of tax administration. You might have a very complicated system that looks very accurate in theory, but it's impossible to implement. For example, in a high-income country, the system tends to be very, very complicated. So you often need tax consultants, tax accountants, maybe special software to do your tax returns. Um, because it's a very complicated economy, the tax system also becomes very complicated. And also the taxpayers um, have the skills to deal with a complicated system. For example, much of it might be electronic, like filing online, so you need to have the IT infrastructure and you also need the supporting services like tax accountants, lawyers, and advisors. For example, it would be unfair to ask for households to file online if they don't have access to high-speed internet. And the last question is more of what we call a social compact or an agreement between citizens and their government. What services do you expect from your government? For example, the tax rates in Northern Europe are very, very high. But in return, citizens get a very high level of public services very good education, medical care, and so on, even child care. In contrast, Americans basically don't trust government. So our rates compared with Northern Europe are lower. But in return, the private sector provides many services that the government provides in Europe. So it's not better or worse, it's just what people expect and are willing to pay in relation to the government. Where a country gets into trouble is, for example, Argentina. They want the quality of services from Northern Europe with low tax rates like in America, and it doesn't work. So that's all I really want to say about different tax systems. And the main point is you want to find the appropriate system for your economy now, and it might not look like any other country, or it might be a mix of different systems. And maybe 20 years from now, as the economy is transformed, your tax system will also evolve. If you have a consultant who comes here and tells you they have the perfect system, send them home. I see my tax friends nodding, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know better. But they can bring comparisons for you and experiences from other countries. But you have to decide yourself what you want. The second topic briefly is if you want to introduce a new tax or tax reform, change an old tax, what questions should you ask to determine if it is better or worse? And the first question should be, will it generate significant revenue? 
So in Myanmar, the tax um, institution, if I'm not mistaken, the name is Internal Revenue, Revenue Department. Revenue, remember yesterday the uh, Assistant Director General said the primary purpose of taxes is to raise money to pay for public infrastructure and services. If it doesn't raise money, stop. It's not worth the financial cost of tax administration or the compliance cost for the taxpayer. And equally important, it's not worth the political cost to the government. You so lose political support and you get no money. But there are two other questions you might also want to ask. What is the impact on economic efficiency or efficiency in the allocation of resources? Do people do things differently? Does it change behavior so they don't pay the tax? Because all of these behavioral changes have a cost to the economy. And I know it sounds a little bit theoretical or academic, but I will give you examples from the income tax, and my colleagues will give you examples from other tax. And the third question you might ask, so the first is revenue. The second is economic efficiency, and that's easy to explain with examples. And the third question, is the tax fair? And I'll explain a little bit of that, I think, in, in the next slide or two. So I started with the third question, money, Not and then money. economic efficiency and social equity. So, as I said, I will give you examples of economic efficiency, but I'd like to explain equity a little bit more. So, equity is a fancy way of saying, is it fair? And we talk about horizontal equity and vertical equity. So, horizontal means people with the same ability to pay the same income or wealth should pay the same tax. Now, I'm going to give you a challenge to your interpretation skills. Because it sounds good in English, I don't know how it will sound. Okay. Um, an, an easy way of thinking about it, equal treatment of equals. I hope. <laughs> you hope, okay. And then vertical equity means the rich should pay more and the poor should pay less. So another test, unequal treatment of unequals. And we have a very specific way of measuring fairness. In the end, who is the ultimate bearer of the tax, meaning who has less income or wealth after the tax? So there's a difference between who pays the tax and who bears the economic burden. Maybe I give an example. Yes. Okay, so um, for example, if I go to a store and I buy something, I pay the tax in the price, but the store pays the tax to the government. So the legal payer is the store, but the person who is poorer is not the store, but the consumer. So the key concept is who has a net change in income or wealth? And that's why we have the concept of statutory incidents, that is who pays the money to the government versus economic burden, that is who in the end suffers the cost. This is very important for the government to understand in the end who will be poorer from the tax. Let me give you a second example. If you have a tax on gasoline, who pays the money to the government? I go to a gas station, I fill up my car, I pay a tax, but who pays the tax to the government? Maybe my tax experts can help me here. The gas station pays the government, but who is really paying? The consumer, absolutely. So this is an example, if you do your analysis and you're worried about social fairness, you have to look beyond the law to see really who has the economic cost. And I'm going to give you a third example that's it's even more complicated and often misunderstood everywhere, including high-income countries. It's the corporate tax, corporate income tax. And of course, the corporation pays the tax to the government. But remember, it's people who pay taxes in the end. The economic cost is people. Corporation is just something on paper. It's not a person. So then you have to ask, is it the workers who pay by lower salaries? 
Is it the consumer who pays by higher prices? Is it the stockholders who pay by lower returns? The, the analysis is very complicated, the answer is complicated, but these are the questions you should be asking. And the answer for the corporation is that it's often shared, but there's a lot of a disagreement on how much for each worker or consumer or shareholder. And another way of looking at fairness is we say we have progressive taxes or proportional taxes or regressive, and I'll give you an example of each in the next slide. For example, in the United States and in most countries, the income tax is progressive. You saw that yesterday in the pre presentation. As your income goes up, the percentage of your income that you pay also goes up. Maybe you start at 10%, and then if you get more income, the next bracket is 15, then 20, 25. So not only do you, do you pay more tax, but the percentage goes up. An example of a proportional tax is that as your income goes up, the percentage stays the same. They often call it a flat tax. The rich pay more, but it's the same percent of income. For example, in America, if the social insurance tax is 6.2% from the employee, 6.2% from the employer, it's the same whatever your income from your first dollar to a, a ceiling. And then regressive tax means as your income goes up, the share of your income in taxes actually goes down. And I think when we talk about consumption taxes, um, Professor Santana will go into this in a little bit more detail, but it's a little bit against logic or counterintuitive to think about this. And I'll give you an example with a 5% sales tax. So you say 5%, the same for big purchase, small purchase. So why isn't it proportional? A tax paid as a share of income. And if you're very poor, you consume all of your income, maybe more of your income, so at the end of the month you have to borrow. So the tax you pay on consumption is a very large part of your small income. But what happens as your income rises? Maybe the food is higher quality, maybe more meat and fish in addition to just vegetables. But your income keeps going up. And then you have extra. You don't consume everything. Maybe you put money in the bank. You make other investments, buy land. So even though you're consuming more, the tax as a share of much larger income is actually smaller. So I went through these concepts because they're very important when you do tax policy to see what is fair, what is efficient, who wins, who loses. And we'll give you many examples of what this means in practice, um, starting with income tax in a couple of minutes. I've included some slides with more technical information for your reference, but I won't go through them now. So those interested in tax administration, some terms and how you evaluate how good your tax administration is. But in the end, if you're looking at a good tax system, you basically want to have three principles in mind. If possible, you want the rate to be very low. It reduces the incentive to cheat. If the rate is low, it's not worth the risk of trying to cheat. And if it's low, people don't change their behavior very much, so it's still relatively efficient for the economy. But then you have a problem. If the rate is low, how do you get a lot of revenue? So that's the second principle. You want to tax as much as you can, for example, all income from all sources. So everybody shares, but everybody has a small burden. Or consumption tax, all goods and all services, but a little tax. This is the theory. In practice, this is very hard to tax everything. It's not economics, it's... But this is the objective. As much as you can, have the rate low and tax everything a little bit if you can. And the third principle, try to keep your system simple. Do not follow the US system. It makes tax administration easier and more transparent. 
And who benefits from very complicated systems? The rich or the poor? If you're poor, you start with nothing and you end with nothing. So all of these special tricks don't help you at all. But if you're rich and you have lots of income or lots of wealth, you will do everything you can to try to reduce your tax. So just remember, it is the rich who benefit from complicated systems, not the poor. So just some general principles, general guidelines when you're designing or changing or implementing tax systems. And some of you look a little bit confused, which is OK. So I'm going to try to take some of this theory and apply it specifically to a tax on income, personal income. But in general, I would say you do not want to do income tax at the subnational level. You do not want to do this. You do not want to do personal income tax at subnational level. It's a complicated, difficult tax that applies to income across jurisdictions. Instead, I suggest you might look at the model from China or Vietnam where you have tax sharing. That is, you get some of the tax by helping the central government. And if you're going to share in the tax, I think it's important to understand some general characteristics about the income tax. But I've included some more technical slides that I will not go into detail, but they're there for your reference if you're interested in more of the technical aspects of the income tax. So some basic concepts about the income tax. And I'm focusing more on the personal income tax rather than the corporate income tax. Around the world, it's usually at the national level. In the US, states, many states have it, but it's tied to the national system, maybe an addition to it. And it's a direct tax on personal or corporate income. And as I said earlier, it's based on your ability to pay, not on benefits that you receive. And we use your income level as a, a proxy, um, an easy indicator of your ability to pay. The higher your income, the more tax you should pay. Oh, you said that, okay. He's ahead of me, way ahead of me, okay. <laughs> But there's something to think about, and it's when you start excluding different things from your income. You make exceptions, and I'll show you a, a way to do it, but you have exemptions, exclusions, deferrals, all sorts of things that are not taxed. And that's just like the government spending money. So instead of collecting the money from you and then spending it, it lets you keep the money to spend. So we have a special name for this, we call it tax expenditure, which seems to be a contradiction. Tax, revenue, and spending. But you're actually spending money, but not collecting it to spend. You're letting the taxpayer spend the money instead of collecting it and then dividing. So the more things you exclude from income, special income, lower tax income, excluded income, the larger this number. The government is giving up money. And it sounds theoretical, but let me give you an example from the largest economy in the world, the United States. Our budget is about four trillion US dollars, about. But tax expenditures, in addition to that, are about one and a half trillion dollars. So think about that. If the US taxed all income, from all sources the same way, we would have a budget surplus and not a deficit. So just think tax people, every time somebody comes to you and asks for a special treatment, like don't tax this or tax it at a lower rate, think about whose budget you're going to cut because you don't have money to pay for it. Tax favors have a financial cost. But politicians, especially legislatures, find it much easier politically to give special treatment than to raise the tax. So don't worry about the technical details, just keep in mind, every time you give somebody special treatment, somebody else will pay for it. 
And this principle applies to all taxes. So think about a sales tax or VAT. Every time you exclude something or tax it at a lower rate, somebody else is going to pay for it. But there are tremendous political pressures all over the world to treat me differently. I tell you, it's only a tax incentive, so I invest, for example. The economist says, tax expenditure, who is going to pay for your incentive? So just keep this in mind over the next couple of days. So let's apply the principles when we look at the tax on income. So what kind of behavioral changes does the tax cause that makes it less efficient for the economy? The taxpayer has high compliance costs. They must keep all sorts of records. They have to fill out all these forms. Again, this diverts resources from other more productive activities. And if the tax rate is very, very high, you might decide, why should I work more if all of my effort goes to the government in taxes? That's the theory. But what really happens in many countries is the following. And I think this would be the response in Myanmar to very high income tax rates, what I'm going to say. You don't work less. You cannot afford to work less. But your work goes underground into the informal cash economy. I see many people nodding and smiling. It's not. rational. You know, why give all of your income to the government? Some, maybe, but not too much. Or if you tax savings, interest on savings at a very high rate, maybe people will spend more and save less and invest less. So can, can you if you it? have a high rate on interest on savings or dividends from investment, people will consume rather than save and invest. So this is what I mean when I say behavioral change that makes your economy less efficient. So in terms of fairness, how would you make an income tax system more fair, more equitable? And remember I said low rate, large base. So again, how do you define the tax base? Who will you tax and what kind of income will you tax? I don't know if it's still the case in Vietnam, but many years ago when I was looking at the tax, singers um, were um, treated differently than laborers, for example. Is that still the case? But it was before. Yes. But they were excluded in the earlier versions. So they've changed it, but you're thinking, sorry, Socialist Republic of Vietnam was taxing labor higher than entertainers. That was, I thought, a little bit interesting. But in fairness to Vietnam, let me give you an example from the United States that's much worse. Earned income, that is your salary, is taxed higher than investment income. So one of the richest people in America, a gentleman named Warren Buffett, said, this is fundamentally unfair when my tax rate is lower than my secretary's tax rate. Who has investment income, for example, capital gains from the sale of stocks and property, rich or poor? Rich or poor? Poor? Rich. Rich. But we say, oh, this is just a, an incentive to invest. But in a country like mine with very high income and wealth inequality, this makes it worse. And a very simple way to reduce inequality and broaden the tax base would be to treat all income, whether earned or investment, the same. But remember again, it's not the economics. The economic argument is very clear. It's the politics. Like everywhere in the world, those who are rich also can influence the political system. So this is what we mean when we talk about the political economy of taxation. It's the economics, but never, ever forget the politics. And let me just give you some general strengths and weaknesses of the income tax system. So the strength is that for the formal economy, for salaried workers, it's really easy to administer by payroll withholding. And because it's progressive, it addresses some of the political demand to tax the rich and make the society more fair. And we have a concept called buoyancy, floating. So buoyancy is floating, like in the water. 
This tax is buoyant because as the economy grows and incomes grow, your tax base grows and your revenue should grow. But because of these weaknesses, it's often better to be a national tax with subnational governments sharing in the revenue. And for the informal sector, the self-employed, it's very difficult to implement. And I don't mean the very little business, the person with the food cart and so on. That's not what I'm talking about. Not the, the micro enterprise, very, very small, simple business. That's not what I mean. Let me explain that. What I mean is small and medium enterprises and self-employed professionals like lawyers and doctors and professors who do consulting, very difficult to tax. Most people think of informal sector as poor people. Thank but you. what if I'm a doctor, during the day I work in a government hospital, so I get some basic salary and benefits, but evening, weekends, and sometimes during the day, I have my private medical practice. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to pay me in, very difficult to tax, but a very high ability to pay. And because it's a difficult, complicated tax, tax administration costs can be high, and taxpayer compliance costs can be high, which makes it very unpopular. And as I said, the tax base is made smaller or eroded by all of these special income adjustments to lower your taxable income. They can use so the tax base gets smaller because you make all of these income adjustments, which reduces your taxable income. So, and this is just an example from the US how your gross income can be legally reduced so that your taxable income is very small. I won't go through every category, but it's a real example. And the last technical slide I'd like to go through is when you talk about income tax rates, people use the same word, tax rate, but it means many different things. So if you compare Myanmar tax rates with other countries, make sure you are comparing the same thing. Right. So some things to keep in mind when you describe your tax rate. The first term is what we call statutory, or what is the rate in the law? 5%, 10%, so, 20%. That's just the stated rate. But that's not the important thing for comparison. What you want to know is what is the effective rate that is, how much do people really pay after all the adjustments? For example, President Trump said the U.S. rates were so high for the corporations at 35%. But the effective rate after all the adjustments on average was about 20%, which is the OECD average. And the, av the other two words to keep in mind are marginal and average tax rate. So marginal means the tax rate for the last dollar that you earned. So maybe some is 5%, 10%, 15%, but maybe the last category is 20%. That is your marginal rate, the highest rate for your last dollar. And then the average, because that affects your incentive to work more or less, the top rate. Because if I work more, all of my additional income will be taxed at that highest rate. And average simply means you take how much you paid at 5%, 10%, 15 20 and you just average that. So I said before the new tax law in America, the average effective corporate tax rate was about 20%, not 35 And then in your slide, um, presentation that you have, I give examples of all of these different terms applied to the U.S. system. I won't explain them, I'll just show you what we have in the, the packet. So just this looks at the statutory, the, the tax rates in the law for the income tax in the U.S. This looks at average versus statutory rate. This looks at um, effective rates by income groups, so you can see if the rich pay more than the poor and so on. So it looks at the distributional impact. For example, you see that the poor actually get money back, and then as your income goes up, the effective rates go up. And the very rich pay the highest at 20 percent versus these other numbers. Yeah. So it's not as progressive as a law, but it's still progressive. And this is just another way of looking at distribution 
of the tax burden in the United States to see if it's fair or not fair. And what you see here is that roughly half of U.S. taxpayers pay no tax or get money back from the personal income tax. That's down here. They're actually negative. The poor getting money back. And most of the revenue, these three, is from the rich. So again, the rich pay most of the tax. And then the question for Americans, is it still fair? Is it still enough or not? And then there's some information about income tax reform in other countries, especially in Eastern Europe, when they went from planned economies to a more market-based economy. And I know we covered an awful lot of material in a short time. But we're going to keep coming back to these principles with other types of taxes. Value added, sales tax, excise taxes, and then tomorrow property tax. But I think it's helpful to have a common framework and the same language when you're looking at tax systems and specific taxes. If I'm not mistaken, I believe we have reached our coffee break time. Is that? Oh, yes, I've got confirmation from the boss. So I think you've worked very hard. You've earned a coffee break. Have lots of coffee and tea and snacks. And then we'll see you again at 11 to talk about consumption-based taxes. Um, no, 15 minutes, right? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So 10.45? 10.45. To talk about consumption-based taxes.